This is an audio series from the Super Freak Media Podcast Network. If you like what you hear, please be sure to show your support and follow us on our other social media platforms. Check out the links listed in the description of this episode to find out more. Thank you. The night draws near and the shadows stir. You're alone in the woods. Dead leaves crunch underfoot and the wind bites at your neck. You feel a chill down your spine as the fog ushers you deeper into the darkness. A darkness full of eyes that watch and whispers of stories. I am your storyteller and this is Campfire Chronicles. Tonight's story follows Danielle and her uncle Curious about the strange and supernatural, they spend their weekends together exploring the occult. Discovering a ritual they've never heard of before, they decide to try their luck at playing the devil's game. Children play games. They always have and always will. But over the course of time, games have evolved. Toy guns have become shooting friends over the internet, earning killstreaks and performing victory dances. Football has been substituted for becoming favourite players, hitting buttons to score goals that would break records in reality. Sticks and stones are now a keyboard and mouse. In my time, we would play real games. Our parents would rather encourage and inspire our imaginations instead of buying them in a shop. Of course, these days I have had to conform to the status quo with my niece, Danielle. She came over to visit my upstairs two-bedroom flat once a fortnight, whilst her mum enjoyed a night of freedom, bringing over favourite games with her current console of the week. We had the sort of relationship where I bought pizza for a night and she ignored me completely, but occasionally shouted obscenities to some guy in Hong Kong while she mutilated his virtual avatar. I like to think that I was the fun and tolerant uncle. After her dinner, she would indulge me by sighing in boredom over a game of poker and then gradually realise that it's fun when you win pocket money. Like I said, the fun uncle. But then she got older. She changed. The colours she'd wear became monochromatic and her hair would look like a unicorn puked on it. She had all of a sudden discovered makeup and looked like an extra from a Romero film. Danielle had levelled up to become the laborious and audacious Danny. But I didn't care. She was just a lot bigger and rolled her eyes more. There was just one thing I truly wish had stayed the same. Her games changed too. Danny stopped bringing over her consoles and would stomp in through my door fresh from some argument with my sister. Then from her backpack she pulled out a board game a Ouija board. Now, obviously there is a stigma to these types of games, but I'm no idiot. She told me the mythos of the cursed game, and I listened with intent as though I hadn't played it thousands of times in my youth. Faking a reluctance to participate due to its macabre and taboo nature, I hesitantly accepted to see her light up just like she used to. In those precious few seconds, Danielle was back. When the sun went down, we played. I even went the extra mile and cracked out some candles to enhance the eeriness of our session. Danny called forth the great spirits of old, asking if there was anybody listening. I, of course, discreetly shifted the glass pointer with my fingers to mark out the most cryptic answers I could get away with, whilst gaping at her in shared amazement. We must have played it for hours. So much so that we had to watch cartoons for an hour because Danny was secretly too scared to go to bed. The next time she came over, I figured it was my turn to raise the stakes, 
so I taught her a little game called Bloody Mary. We played traditionally, with our bathroom light off, and when she had said those magic words, I scared her so bad that she went transparent. I was well aware of the red flags that her new interest should have shown me, but I was so excited to see her want to do something even remotely active, and now we shared a form of common interest again. Hindsight is a horrible thing. Danny's fascination with the supernatural went on to the point where she would find beauty in the repugnant. I even bought her an old doll from an antique shop for her 14th birthday to watch her grin with ebullience to my fabricated tale that it was haunted and had an evil spirit lurking within. She loved it and added it to her ever-growing collection. On a fortnightly basis, she'd bring various spine-chilling games over and I'd tell her the urban legends I knew that would beat the crap out of any creepy pasta, or whatever she called it. It was great. Every two weeks was like Halloween to us, and I became the fun uncle again. However, the months flipped by on the calendar, and Danny began to once again roll her eyes in boredom. The games had grown old, and nothing scared her anymore. The well had run dry. So I did what any responsible, boisterous uncle would do in my situation. I took to the internet. Through forums and quick searches, our spooktacular nights had new life breathed into them. Uncanny games provoked our paranoia, whilst paranormal rituals jump-scared our imaginations to the next level. My search for new content persisted, and soon I received an anonymous email. According to the text I was sent, all the games we previously played apparently had details stripped from their procedures in order to make them safe. Not only that, but evidently they were all descended from one singular ancient game, something called Nicoyope's Pledge. The email that outlined the game came alongside a warning. It absolutely, under no circumstance, should be played unless the participant is willing to lose everything. If this disturbing instruction should be believed, then I just hit the jackpot. None of the other games had any physical effect on us previously, and we found sinister joy in the hypothetical supernatural possibilities of each one we participated in. My practical maturity and the knowledge of physical reality gave ignorant reassurance to the simple fact that this one will be no different. Therefore, I ignorantly printed off the guidance pages and prepared my theatrical pitch to Danny. Dramatically setting the scene of how I came across such an ancient ritual in an old forgotten library book, I witnessed Danny revert into my Danielle as she clung to every word of my tall tale. No doubt or consideration crossed her mind as she scanned the now dyed and aesthetically singed instruction pages. She shot up and demanded to be driven home so that we could collect all of the ingredients needed from her emporium of gothic wonders in her bedroom. A brief return trip ensued and we got to work. Danny prepared the spare room by copying the images from my pages, pouring soil onto my wooden floors to shape archaic symbols. Small flowers were then planted into the soil lines, and cups of salt water were placed into their required spots. Whilst she made her room into a cleaner's nightmare, I prepared one of Danny's turquoise pendants, a pinch of loose tobacco, and a few shards of coal that I put into a mortar bowl. Whilst doing so, I remember a moment of self-reflection upon which I realised the absurdity of what we were doing, but I slipped back into my childish excitement when Danielle skidded into the kitchen to tell me she was finished. We put the bowl in its proper place and completed the next required task. Patience. Anticipation built until the described soul hour in which we could supposedly invoke some sort of deity and play a dark and long forgotten game. We watched TV, ate pizza and played poker until my phone alarm sounded to warn us of the approaching time of 1am. We scurried into the spare room and double checked everything was in place. We exited the room, closed the wooden door, set down a black candle and huddled down for the next steps. The soul hour's solemn chime sounded, so we lit the candle and turned off the lights. Then, in unison, we knocked seven times, chanting, Nicoyope, come forth, we wish to gamble. Trembling with unrest, we grinned at each other, anticipating some sort of response. But nothing. Silence. Floorboards creaked at the adjustments of our legs as we waited patiently. 
I faked my disappointment with a sigh and started to my feet, but she hadn't moved an inch. Silently kneeling in the dark, staring at the door. I diffused the stale situation that grew with every second of her stillness like any responsible adult. I turned the corner and returned with a leap to make her jump. Usually these antics are met with frustrated laughter, but this time she grasped my shirt with tears in her eyes and shushed me with a trembling finger to her jet black lips. Then, Danny's finger quivered down to the space just below the door. I followed her indication, but didn't register anything in particular before our little black candle was inexplicably extinguished. It wasn't blown because the flame didn't lean in the direction of a draft before dying, nor did it simmer and spark out. Rather, it was like someone had put it out with their fingers. I looked at the bubbling candle wax in confusion as my niece squeaked, Look! My concerned gaze averted from her terrified expression to the dim turquoise glow pulsing from below the door. I froze in confoundment, trying to rationalise the source of the illumination. The entrancement of the light locked me in place, and I listened to Danny's increased panting as a wisp of smoke crept from below the door like some sort of snake, rearing up to ward off danger. The smell of tobacco hit the back of my throat, and I snapped out of my entrapment to open the door, ready to extinguish the obvious and inevitable tobacco fire that was most likely beginning to spread. But as I lunged for the door, my confusion only doubled down as the room came into vision. Empty. No fire. No light. Except the orange trickle of the outside street lamps. The entire room was scarce of what we had previously readied. No compost, no flowers, the cups were gone, and the only thing that remained was the smell of burnt tobacco. I stood unsure for a few moments, replaying what we both witnessed inside my head. Nothing added up. I turned to see my trembling niece choking on her tears as she coughed, You shouldn't have opened the door. I strode to her and helped her to her feet, swiping the instruction papers from the floor. I skimmed the text and said, You sure? It was clear at this point that perhaps we had come across some sort of psychological illusion, like that of the arm floating trick or the show me to your grave game. No, but you weren't supposed to in any of the others. What just happened? She croaked as she smudged the black makeup from her eyes with her now wet sleeve. A few minutes went by as I filtered through my head, finding a logical way to give her a reassuring answer. I went to the bathroom, ripped some toilet paper off the roll and returned to her, passing her tissue while signalling the tears and snot streaming down her face. I don't know. Did you sprinkle a little something onto the pizzas? She coughed out a nervous laugh. No? Not something from your teenagey goth parties? You'd be surprised what a dusting of LSD and a mood light can do to you. I reached for the light switch as she spluttered a giggle to humour my attempt at lightening the mood, hoping she didn't fully understand my LSD reference. I flicked the switch, but nothing happened. I went to check the fuse box, but all the breaker switches were still on. My logical, mature mind reassured me that a coincidental power failure had occurred. Before the childish doubt and the tormenting suspicion that we were in a really bad horror film crept in. My cadaverous niece relapsed into panic at the sight of my failed attempt. I took my phone out of my pocket to find it was dead. I held the power button, but had no luck. I sighed as she gave hyperventilating appeals to be taken home. Probably the best option. We left her overnight gear to be picked up at a later date and threw our coats on as we scurried through the complete darkness downstairs towards the exit. I blindly reached for the handle but hadn't found it. My hand slid along the blank piece of PVC where it should have been and found nothing. Hurry up! She urged as I fumbled for anything that could be used to open the door but to no avail. Disorientated panic washed over me as I realised that the handle, keys and hinges of the door were all inexplicably gone and leaving through the only exit from the flat was no longer an option. The pressure of parental responsibility loomed over my suspended body whilst my mind swam through practical rationality for what seemed like an eternity. 
Seconds expired to the pendulum of Danny's frightened respiration whilst I fought childish fear and put together some semblance of a strategy. I reminded myself to replenish my facade of bravery and decided that the door or one of the flat windows had to be smashed open. I held Danny by the shoulders, reassuring her that I would be back soon after fetching something heavy to break the door down. She speechlessly winced and nodded. I began hastily making my way back up to the flat, when an ominous glow, the same as behind the door, crept out from the corner at the top of the stairs. Fear seized my legs as I stumbled back down the steps I had made, struggling to stay upright. I watched, expecting something to happen as the glow loomed over us, illuminating the topmost step and gently touching the second. A sickening tightness in my gut snatched my breath away as I was wiping the blinding build-up of tears in my eyes. I tried, in vain, to save face in front of my niece, who was now voicelessly wailing in the corner, curled up in dismay. I knew something was going to crawl around the corner. Some bony hand would grip the edge of the wall. But it never came. The glow silently dimmed back into the flat as we froze, helplessly trembling in expectation for some terrible thing that would creep around the corner at any second. Impatience got the better of me, and I followed the evanescent turquoise light, searching for anything that could possibly be used as a weapon. Blindly shaking in the darkness, I found a rogue shoe halfway up the stairs and brandished it. It wasn't much, but it was the best I had. I held it at the ready as I steadied my legs. Glancing behind to send Danny a reassuring nod, I climbed the staircase. I cautiously shot around the corner ready with my weaponized footwear, but found only darkness. Feeling the floor as I continued, I managed to find a hammer that was left from hanging up a picture the previous Monday. Finally something that could help. I quickly turned tail and scurried back down the stairs to try my hand at breaking the door down with the nail hammer. I swung for the door hoping to break it with one masculine attempt but made no progress. I then swung for the glass porthole at the top of the door with as much strength as I could muster, but only managed to crack it. I leaned back for a second swing when the creeping smell of tobacco shot up my nostrils. I checked behind me and saw the turquoise light had sneaked to the top of the stairs just out of sight. No longer willing to await whatever horrific apparition that could spring around the corner, my hammer swung at the window when a cry came from the top of the stairs. The 14-year-old at my ankle screamed in trepidation as I spun around to provide some sort of protection. It was not that of any cry I'd heard before, but something that I could only imagine would resonate from some sort of hunting pack animal when finding their prey. The light grew brighter with each and every distant howl and shriek beckoning out to us before dimming in the silence. The smell of tobacco blocked my nose as I held the child in one arm with my hammer at the ready in the other. We were left in darkness. The disheartening realisation that I would have to go back upstairs so that we could both make our escape through a window finally hit me. Danielle clawed and clung to my arm as though I was slipping away. I took her by the hand and held it tight. Reassuring Danny of her safety, I demanded that she stay put. My suggestion was met with a barrage of objection and refusal. I took her face in my hands and told her I'd return soon. I swung for the porthole once more with a shatter and instructed her to call for help until I came back. Fueled by innate, adrenaline-infused anger, I made for the stairs. I navigated the darkness of the corridor into the flat entirely through memory shifting and jumping with every sound that my feet provoked on the floorboards. Behind me, the desperate yelps for help from anyone that might hear slowly faded as I crossed the threshold of my main flat hallway. I stared in entrancement at the dissipating glow that seemed to be going towards my bedroom. I headed forwards to the kitchen and managed to grab myself a carving knife for my empty hand before carefully treading in suspenseful caution towards the spare room. I lingered just outside the open room for a moment and directed my gaze at my closed bedroom, the aqua light pulsing from under the door. I hurried into the spare room and swung for the window. It shattered instantly. Suddenly I heard the same cry as before emanating from my bedroom. 
I followed the howls calling out like children laughing as I glanced at the door. From below, the beams of light were broken by several animals scratching at the floor, digging furiously to get to me, pushing their way to the front, their claws clicking against the wood as they scraped the hard ground. I lunged back into the hallway, but as I took the first step, the howls and screams of whatever was hunting us ceased. Despite better judgement, I peered at the door to see the light under it to be no longer pulsing, but boldly slithering out of any crack or minute hole it could in the wood. The handle creaked downwards. Something was opening the door. With each and every slow staccato movement the handle made, an amalgamation of predatorial cries grew louder. I knew I wouldn't make it back to the front door in time and slinked back into the guest room as the tormentor swung open my bedroom door. My eyes were blinded by the light as I dived behind the door and slammed it shut, pitting my body weight against it as the door was rammed repeatedly by the howling, snarling creatures, my ears bursting with every cry. I let out a helpless scream, pushing for dear life at the wood whilst my attackers threw themselves against it. My shoelaces repelled from the ingress with every huff the assailants let out as they dug towards my feet. My eyes screwed shut, praying for more strength as my arms began to buckle against my defensive barrier with every pound against it. Scratching, digging, howling, hissing, battering. My door handle furiously jiggled off its screws from the stress it was taking. The door was knocked ajar for a brief moment when my shoulder gave in to the siege. For just a second, I could make out some sort of skeletal snout protruding through the space in the door, disrupting the beam of light and the suffocation of tobacco smoke. Whilst holding against my onslaught of attackers, I swung at the skin-grafted snout with my hammer as best I could. The door slammed shut. Suddenly, the beating stopped, and the howling made towards the corridor. My crippling fear bubbled into courage as Danny's petrified screams made my blood curdle. I threw the door open and winced at the disorientating light, challenging whatever was in front of me. I could barely see the hammer and knife I had readied, but nonetheless, I hurried to help my screaming niece. The excited cries of my attackers galloped further away down the corridor. I passed the kitchen door, grazing the frame with my weak shoulder before something tore into the flesh of my arm. My fingers came limp around the hammer and it dropped out of my hand as some unseen creature threw me into the kitchen. My back hit the cupboard with a crack. A high-pitched cry sounded off not two feet from my face before I felt its jaws lock around my shoulder, sinking into bone. I screamed and maniacally stabbed against the abomination with my carving knife. My hand felt sparse, bristle-like fur as I panickingly hacked and slashed at the creature that was relentlessly chewing on my flesh. I hit my own arm on a few occasions as the thing shook me like a dog playing with a rope toy. It lost its grip on my shoulder and slammed itself against my head as I continued to slash. Then I felt its teeth soar into my right leg. I gave out a cry and my slashing was interrupted as it began to drag me back into the hallway with excited tugs. With my one useful arm, I traded the knife for the hammer I felt graze against me on the floor and began chiselling away at the creature. Every hit being followed by a hound-like whimper. My hair got caught in the wet trail my gushing leg and shoulder left behind as I was dragged into the living room. Giving every swing and club I could deliver despite my strength being ripped out of me, the creature furiously huffed and snarled as I beat away its burning breath with the cold, rusty iron hammer. Primal instinct drove me to lean forward, gripping what I could only assume served as ears for the creature, forcing my leg further into its mouth. I pushed with the hopes of choking and disorientating my predator to give me a second to escape. However, my excruciating dread increased when I felt the creature dislodge its jaw and continue to gnaw a more of my leg. In a panic, I continued to pummel at the monstrosity's skull. Barely noticing that the light had begun to dim as I continued swinging, the atrocity's eyes only just gave out a visible black glint of reflection. Then at once, the thing released my leg and I lay for a second on the floor basking in my own bedevilment before peeling myself off of the cold wood to limp for the hallway. Each nerve gave out an electric twang as I called out for the niece that I could no longer hear over the howling pack. I followed the failing glow into the corridor as it faded to darkness. I turned the corner for the stairs. In the moon-essenced luminance of the streetlights falling through the porthole in the front door, I could make her out. Danny was sat in darkness with her legs resting in the glimpse of moonlight. 
her white, scratched and bruised legs showing through the new rips in her black jeans. I called out her name as I curled against the banister in pain. To my hopeful surprise, she softly answered, Yeah? Her voice was calm and almost oblivious to any previous danger. Are you alright? I growled out as my mouth filled with blood. I'm just fine. She sighed coldly as if her mind was on other things. Something was horribly wrong. That wasn't my Danielle talking back. I stumbled down the stairs towards her and slipped, clumsily rolling down the steps, landing on my back. I then crawled to her and rested my arm on her leg. I broke a window upstairs! Let's go! I pulled her towards me with my good arm, and the horror turned me upright as she lifelessly slumped forward into the light. Her eyelids, lips, and nose had all been mauled away. Her jaw swung open as I recoiled. Her bright blue hair, now dyed into purple, tumbled from her head onto her shoulders in one clump as her skinless scalp trickled red. Bits of her flesh had been ripped from her corpse and her t-shirt hung on her back in tatters. Tears poured from my eyes as the grief tore at me. My heart sank and I shakingly embraced what was left of my little Danielle. My breathless wails of despair as I held the lifeless child in my arms were left oblivious to the distant snarls that stalked us. I unscrewed my eyes to see we had been washed turquoise. Delicately laying her body back, I picked up the hammer and turned for the mountainous staircase, quaking in hatred. I slumped my way up the stairs, shouting, wailing, growling for my niece's murderers to come and finish me off. Taunting the unseen pack as they did me, I beat my hammer against the walls and stamped my good foot in a berserk rage. Blood dripped off of my chin and sizzled on my chest. I tried to wipe my face to clear the blood, tears and mucus that were flowing from it, but I merely smudged it across my cheekbones. I hobbled furiously towards the howling cries and turned the corner of the corridor to face my soon-to-be killers. I lay witness to the pulsing of light beating harshly on my blood-soaked body as a spectre of complete darkness loomed in front of it. Shadows of several four-legged creatures waited patiently for their master to give the order, panting as their drool and bloodthirsty eyes glinted in the glow. The bristles of their manes gently touched the light whilst their master stood examining me. The adrenaline made the hot blood pump from my broken skin. I spat the crimson rising in my throat onto the floor as I challenged them with a growl. The hounds began to howl and cackle in amusement before their master clicked to command them silent. Eons passed before something was softly whispered out to them in some sort of unrecognisable language. The hounds bounded towards me. One leaped for my face but was met with my hammer. The rest swept me off my feet. Lacerating their fangs into flesh, they ripped at anything that was attached to me before my back had even hit the floor. The pain of the creatures tearing into me had now dissolved and their howls of triumph were beaten from my ears by the sound of my drumming heart. The pack withdrew and I lay staring at the ceiling as my pounding heart beat to the rhythm of my choked, broken lungs drowning in tobacco smoke and blood. The spectre, still a void of shadow in the dying turquoise light, now hung over me. Nothing much could be made of it as my vision blurred, but I felt the cold touch of wood as it readied some sort of club against my head. The spectre pulled back and whispered something unregisterable. Then it swung. Darkness took me. I shot up from the floor in the hallway, squinting at the sunlight streaming in. Confused for a second, my mind immediately questioned the reality I had awoken to. I examined myself on the floor. My clothes were in tatters. I was caked in blood that had crumbled overnight. I lifted my body from the dried brown blood on the floorboards and double-checked myself. No pain. No wounds. I rushed for the front door where Danny had been mangled and lay dead. Skidding to the top of the steps, I looked down to see the door in perfect condition with the handle and hinges in their rightful places, but her body was missing. I called out to her and had no response as I rampaged around my flat in search each call being answered with silence. 
Frantic panic completely shadowed the realisation that one of my pockets had become heavy since I woke up and was now jingling furiously. I stopped in my living room and dove my hand into my pocket as I pulled out piles of tiny gold-coloured discs. I dropped them to the floor in neglect, pulling my phone out of the ragged pocket to my right and found it was in working order. I typed the passcode incorrectly twice through shaking and eventually got in to find her name in my phone. I called the number but hit an unused dial tone. I then went to my sister's number to find she answered, barraging her with questions and a distraught apology. She eventually said, give me ten minutes, and hung up. As I continued to search for Danny from under scatter cushions on the sofa to climbing into the loft, I heard my sister let herself in. She calmly walked around the corner and jumped at the sheer sight of my ravaged appearance. I stuttered out everything I knew had happened and what I had seen. My sister listened with a concealed horror, expressing concern and eventually she embraced me, assuring me with confusing facts that I did not want to hear. She had never given birth to a child. I was never a fun uncle, and my knowledge had seemingly become delusion. After my doubt had been worn out by my knowing contradictions of everything my sister had told me, she took me to a hospital to talk to someone. I hadn't lost anyone. Yet, I had indeed lost everything. Danny had never existed. That was two years ago. I have never been able to find answers. It seemed over time that the deeper I searched for her, the more trouble it got me in. I tried everything, even tried doing the ritual again, but found no result. My ears burst to her screams every night at 1am, and through closed eyes I am still disturbed by the turquoise glow. Each and every night I still shoot up to the sound of howling. I no longer go to family gatherings because it's all so empty. The gold coins that I found in my pocket now sit in an urn with her name and birthday inscribed onto it. My Danielle. She'd be 16 next month. That was why I no longer play the games of children by Mitchell Robbins. Should you find yourself lost and alone again, join me for another twisted tale. But tonight, as you leave the glow and warmth of the campfire and the last ember flickers in the dying light, remember that these stories will stay with you. listening to an audio series from the Super Freak Media Podcast Network. To show your support on this project, along with the other content we create, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. You can keep up to date with everything else we are up to on social media using the links in the description of this episode. Thank you for listening.